Hello, and welcome to the STEM Leadership Cadre Showcase. I'm Marnie Landry from Canyon Professional Development at Grand Canyon University. And you're joining us today for a live tour of Taliesin West, Frank Lloyd Wright's building and masterpiece. And we're gonna get a tour of all the things that are available to students and teachers and the community. And I'm gonna hand the, the spotlight over to my partner, Corey Araza. Thank you so much, Marnie. And I'm so excited to be here at Taliesin West. That was a mouthful. Frank Lloyd writes Taliesin West. We're gonna learn all about it and we're gonna learn why maybe it's called Taliesin West. But without further ado, I'm going to introduce Abby Wilson, who is in charge of all the youth and, and pro, youth and family programming. Yeah. Uh, so that means teachers of STEM, Abby is your person. She is going to tell us all about what we need to know as an educator, what we need to know as a as a mom or you know a, a guardian or anybody else who wants to come up here and enjoy this amazing. I like how you said that. His home. Let's let's see. Let's start from there, Abby. Yeah, take it away. So hi guys, welcome to Taliesin West. Um, like I said, my name is uh, Abby Wilson. I'm the Youth and Family Programs Manager. I've been here for about three years. My background is I have a bachelor's degree in history and a master's degree in museum studies. So I've spent the 12 years of my career um, working in museum education at museums across the country. And I am fortunate enough to be at Taliesin West right now. Um, it also means that I am not of a STEM background, but I have had the joy of learning a lot about STEM and then incorporating it into the humanities and into the arts, which in a lot of ways is architecture at the heart. So architecture is the beautiful blending of art and culture and engineering and STEM. And so we try to say that to kids as often as we can when kids come here. Um, we have about 2,000 students a year currently coming for field trips here at Taliesin West. We'd love that number to grow. So if you are interested in coming here for our field trip, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our different options. So we have a menu of, of offerings, but every field trip to Taliesin West includes a one hour tour with me or one of my museum educators who are specially trained to talk to students. We don't give you um, one of the grown up tour guides. <laughs> we give you someone who is used to talking to your children. So whether you're bringing kindergartners or 12th graders, you will get someone who is ready and able to talk to your students and key into those content areas that you want to focus on. Wow, that is fantastic. And folks, don't worry. Abby's not only incredibly talented with the with the littles, but also the bigs, because I know I taught high school STEM. Yep. And I'm really interested in knowing how to incorporate architecture and math, because sometimes that is often something that kids don't kids that are a little bit bigger don't see the connection. So looking forward to seeing some connections. And also there's a virtual tour Correct. link that we will be putting in the show notes. So we won't be able to go to every every room. If you saw every room at Taliesin West, you'd be on camera for four hours. Nobody wants that. <laughs> so um, we have had a company uh, right in 2020, go figure, um, who came and mapped the whole place virtually. Uh, we can throw a link in the show notes so that if you are for some reason unable to take your students to Taliesin West, you can actually dive inside and virtually walk around um, which is super fun. It's kind of like Google Maps, but just for this historic site. That is so cool. And so don't forget about that. And then throughout this showcase, please ask any questions in the chat, or you can unmute yourself and ask a question of Abby as we move along. Thank you. I'm excited to get started. Yeah. So um, one thing we always like to talk about when the kids first get here off the bus is what Taliesin West is made out of, but also who made Taliesin West. Um, First of all, you mentioned uh, Taliesin West, that is a mouthful, what is that name? Uh, it is Welsh. So this is the home of Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank Lloyd Wright is the, um, in many ways, considered one of the world's greatest architects. He would certainly have considered himself that. Um, and he lived here. So he designed over a thousand houses, uh, a thousand buildings in his lifetime. But this place is special because this was his home. So unlike going to one of his greatest hits, which are beautiful in, own, in their own special ways, this was his home. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just his home. He lived here with his wife. He lived here with his ch children. And he lived here with his students. 
And a lot of a lot of people don't know that. And definitely most students, when they come here for a field trip, they don't know that this place was a school. Mm. So the question is, do you want to live in the same home of your, with your students? Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it was a school, though. So just like uh, kids are coming here to learn about architecture 80 years ago when Fred first came here, he was teaching kids here about architecture. They're a little older than the kids that we have, right? They were more like college age students, late 20s. Um, but they are actually the ones who built this place. Wow. So Taliesin West, this school, this um, campus was all about learning by doing. And if you are here to learn architecture, architecture is building buildings. Wow. And what better way to build buildings, to learn from buildings than to Build actually, buildings. actually build them. So you're saying that Frank Lloyd Wright's students built they this, did. like even these walls, they, like they were a part of this? They, when they first got here in the late 30s, they went out in the desert, which was empty, right? Scottsdale, almost non-existent. Uh, they got wheelbarrows and pickaxes. And this is men and women. Frank Lloyd Wright uh, accepted both to his school in the 30s. And uh, they went out in the desert and they picked rock. Wow. And they didn't just pick the rock there. They decided what patterns they wanted to make of it. And they laid the walls. They built this place. Wow. So even the the heights they determined, mm -hmm. decor. Right overseeing it, of course. Uh, I see some fruit trees. Were they there in the 30s? Uh, I think the exact year. I know the orchard was there during Wright's lifetime. Frank Lloyd Wright passed away in 1959. So this was really, he was here in Arizona during the last third of his life. Um, but when the students get here, we always tell them that just so that they can appreciate that students like them, maybe a little older, but students like them who were here to learn things like them are the ones who made this UNESCO World Heritage Site. There's only two UNESCO World Heritage Sites in Arizona. One's the Grand Canyon. The other is us. Wow. Did you so, hear that? I didn't know that. That's amazing. It's <laughs> a pretty big deal. So um, we always talk to the kids about that. It's also a great way to talk to them um, a little earth science, a little geology, because Frank Lloyd Wright specifically made the wall out of desert rock so that it looked like the desert was rising up to make the wall of this place. Oh, so fascinating. He brought brick, he brought cement, but instead he built the walls out of the desert floor. But I'm just excited because I, I really am thrilled to see like how the desert comes to life in form of a yeah. home. Yes. So um, this whole place was a home and a studio is usually what we say. Okay. So for example, this big room right here, and we can walk past it. You can see the full length of it. That is where the students did their work. So it's called the drafting studio. Mm. Um, so students would sit at their desks and draw drawings, talking to K-12 students when they come here and explaining what architecture was like 80 years ago, that it was spending hours hunched over a desk, drawing and measuring, drawing, measuring, drawing, measuring. Um, sounds like a nightmare to them, but we have this one really fun activity and I'll, I'll show you when we get back to the classroom where we have students measure a building. And it's not a huge building, it's about the size of like, a shed, but they all think it's easy. They get, they get real like, oh, you just want me to measure this? This is gonna be easy. It takes them like a half an hour to measure the building, to learn about perimeter and area and how to measure large spaces, how to measure for precision, how to measure for accuracy. And I think it gives them a greater appreciation of the concept of someone hand drawing all the plans for the Guggenheim. Wow. <laughs> okay. So I heard precision and measurement for accuracy. Yes. And I know we have a class that we offer about measurement and estimation. Yes. So like there's no estimation in building buildings. Am I correct? No. And we talked to the, it's so funny talking to kids about that, um, especially younger ones, kind of explaining like what might happen if you don't get the measurements just right for the walls. Like the walls won't meet, will they? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, we show them in Legos, like, oh, you thought this was three bricks, but it's actually four bricks. Now your walls don't meet. Uh, yeah, so yeah. we talk about the importance of precision, getting as it close down to the right centimeter as you can, um, even when it's a pain. Because sometimes they're like, this is a pain. This is taking me forever. Yeah. And this is the building they were actually uh, working in. Yes. So we'll show you the building, folks, and we'll get kind of moving just so you can see amazing scenery as well as architecture.
and if you have any questions, again, pop them into the chat or ask us out loud. I'm noticing just even the lighting. Was this uh, th was this something that happened in the 30s? I mean, yeah. did, did, did he think about lighting as well? Oh, sure. So Frank Lloyd Wright was known um, as being, he always had the complete vision of every project he worked on, um, which is unusual for architects. It certainly was 80 years ago. It especially is today. He, when he designed a project, he thought about everything. He thought about the lights. He thought about the paint color. He thought about the furniture inside. In some instances, he even designed clothes for people to wear that would match his building. Uh, talk about a true systems and engineer. He was, he was, he wanted the whole, wanted the whole vision. Unfortunately, none of those clothes survived because I really want to see them. But we have letters of people saying like, Frank designed an outfit. That's um, funny. So he, he, in a lot of ways, was both an architect and an interior designer, but the term interior design didn't exist as we know it back in the 30s. Um, but that is something we offer. We do uh, eight weeks of summer day camp, and one of our weeks is entirely about interior design. So they get to uh, try their hand at designing furniture. Um, they make little lamps that they can take home. We talk about color theory and stuff like that. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. I did not know that there was an interior design course over the summer. That's ex that's exciting. Okay, thank you so yeah. much. So this whole room is where the students used to sit. Um, so that is the drafting studio. And if we walk a little bit further to the triangular pool, this is where we usually with the students start talking about geometry. Mm -hmm. um, See, there's that math word again. It keeps coming in. Um, the geometry was very important to Frank Lloyd Wright because he practiced a specific style of architecture called organic architecture. When we talk to the kiddos, um, especially the littler ones, we talk about where they might have heard the word organic before. So usually they say the grocery store. And so if you see the word organic in the grocery store on the carrots, what are they trying to tell you about the carrots? Eventually we get to, well, the carrots are from nature. So organic architecture is architecture from nature. And that was at the heart of every one of Frank Lloyd Wright's over a thousand plus designs. And it wasn't just nature in general, it was the nature of the place where the building was. So here in Arizona, our building's made of rocks. Not just any rocks, rocks from right here. Uh... If he was building a building in an oak forest on the East Coast, the house would be made out of oak, beautiful, polished oak. But he always wanted to highlight the natural elements of the structure, um, of the landscape. He also wanted the structure to blend into the landscape. So behind us, and it'll be easier to see in just a second, um, our McDowell Mountains are very triangular. Mm. Frank Lloyd Wright noticed that. And he wanted Talias and West to mimic the triangular geometry of the mountains of the landscape so it would look like it was one with the mountain so you can kind of see right there there's the mcdowell and once i point out the triangle to the children they yeah. turn into the students who visit us it turns into a game like, triangle 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 oh that's a cool idea though yeah. in the classroom yes. you could bring that to the classroom yeah. once you talk about okay organic architecture maybe mm -hmm. there are other shapes that students can see and point out in like out outside if you could take them out for recess. Yeah, and there's, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright is very well known for that. There's other architects that use that same concept in a different way. So there's a very famous woman named Zaha Hadid. She was an architect who was known for using um, more swoopy shapes. Mm -hmm. So there's, you could do a whole unit comparing Zaha and Frank and talk about how he was into more geometric shapes. Zaha was into more uh, blobby. Like shape. circular -ish. Yeah, Yeah, uh, blobby shapes. But comparing and contrasting the difference and then seeing the different ones in nature and in architecture. I love that. Yeah. So. And you could maybe say something like uh, parabola for blobby. But oh, I yeah. like blobby a lot better. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a blobby. That sounds wonderful. Uh, it's my inner mathematically. My history major coming out. I, I can love only it. think of blobs. No, I think, <laughs> but that's good. That's neat. Now, I, I'm noticing the red door. Is yeah. that something I should be noticing right off the bat? Yeah, so red is one of the strongest colors here at Taliesin West. Frank Lloyd Wright decided to use red as his primary color because he thought it was the color of the Arizona sunset. He was not from Arizona, 
when he first came here in the 30s, he was um, absolutely enamored with it, just absolutely fell in love with it. He was from Wisconsin, and so he had never seen anything like this before. Sure. Everything about it was uh, exotic and spellbinding. And for a lot of the kids that come here on our field trips, even though they are from the valley, they are not used to being outside in the desert. So I think in the same way that Frank was absolutely enamored with the strange rocks and plant life, a lot of the students that come here feel the same way when they get off that bus. A lot of them, first of all, have never been on the bus. So that's very exciting for <laughs> wow. them. Wow. Yeah, a lot of a lot of the kiddos, um, they're not used to being on a bus. They're very excited to be on a field trip. They're not used to being outside in the desert. Um, so we talk about that too. We talk about the plants and the animals that kind of captured Frank Lloyd Wright's imagination and how it might capture their imagination. I love it. Now, Abby, um, I'm noticing the triangular pool yeah. as we just talked about triangles. Yes. But I'm also wondering, you just said that, you know, he really embodied the, the desert landscape, yeah. not much water. Yes. So tell me about water right here. So we talk about form and function as well. Um, so we talk to children about uh, form is the beautiful part function is the useful part oh i like the that best things in the world will have both form is the beautiful part mm -hmm. function is the what you, the useful the part. useful part i so like that the pool is beautiful we can all agree it looks really nice right here yes it's very very pretty right I'm just behind gonna the pool give you the, give you the reflection of the pool yep right behind the pool is what was the kitchen whoa so when, oh, go away, bumblebee. There is a bee hanging around. Um, Wait, where, where's the kitchen? The kitchen is that checkerboard area. Okay. Go away, bumblebee. <laughs> but it's this nature. Always, this always happens to me at least once a uh, field trip as well. So I love it. Nature. You know. So the um, kitchen so the is kitchen right behind right the pool. There. Yeah. And so a yeah, little social studies in here too. In the 30s, Scottsdale, very, very small. Like about two blocks of Old Town, right? city of phoenix was maybe six blocks if there was a fire here at taliesin west the nearest help was like an hour away they were up here on the hill in a very rural area on their own so what is the part of the building most likely to catch fire Ooh, the kitchen, the kitchen. <laughs> she's got something here so, or shall i say frank yeah so mr wright put a large body of water just right here just in case uh, as far as I know, they've never had to use it for that purpose, but it is form and function together as a well. Okay, that's fascinating. Because how many people as a systems engineer, like really thinking about a whole system, yep. is thinking about what could go wrong? Well, uh, you know, we do that in our STEM world, what yeah. could go wrong in our STEM classrooms, but fantastic idea. Okay, yeah. so not only that, but it's got the triangular beauty piece as well. Okay. Fascinating. He could have made it a square pool. He could have made it a circle pool. He could have put a tank under the ground and hit it, but instead he did form and function as one. So interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. There's a, that triangular mountain and lots of bunnies out oh here tonight, y'all. Yeah. This is really kind of cool. They're, uh, again, nature, nature. They're, they're a part of the form and function, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so, we also talk about um, when the students come here. I, oh, like I said, the the landscape. So the building is long and low, and that's to blend in with the long, low horizon kind of here. And that ties to the name Taliesin West, which was your first question, actually. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright, his family, um, their heritage was Welsh from the country of Wales. Wales. Um, I have a little and bit of Welsh in my so, background. Yeah, so he bit. was very, very proud of that fact. His first uh, main large home that he built for himself and one of his wives uh, was called Taliesin. It is in Wisconsin. Taliesin means shining brow in Welsh, which is a ridiculous thing to name something. But he called it that because he thought a building should not be on top of a landscape like a hat but it should be a beautiful part of a landscape like your eyebrow so like your eyebrow is part of your face and not worn on the top of your head like a hat can you tell i do this for kindergarten i love it <laughs> um just like you don't wear your eyebrows on your head like a hat your eyebrows are part of your face the building should be part of the landscape 
not on top of the landscape. So this building is not on top of the mountain. It's part of the mountain. So the original Taliesin is Shining Eyebrow. Then he built this place in the 30s to go in the winter time. So we are technically Shining Eyebrow West. Shining Eyebrow <laughs> West. This is fascinating. And Shining an Eyebrow in Welsh. Welsh in, in the desert, which mm -hmm. is very different. Yes. Oh, that is so interesting. <laughs> I, and I, what do you think um, he would think of houses being built on top of mountains? Because a lot of people like to do that. He would, he, you know, I don't. We don't really know. We as can't a, ask him. As a humble person who works here, I cannot speak, speak for the great Frank Lloyd Wright. But based on my understanding of him, um, I don't think he would like that one bit. Uh, he infamously, and I have a picture of this I can show you in a second. Um, he had a client, uh, the Kaufman family from Kaufman's Department Stores, which some folks yeah. might have heard of, um, who wanted him to build a home in the woods in Pennsylvania outside of Pittsburgh. And they had this beautiful spot in the woods with a waterfall running through it. And they kind of figured he'd put the house so it could look at the waterfall. Frank Lloyd Wright didn't want to look at the waterfall. He wanted the house to be part of the waterfall. That house became Falling Water, uh. which is his, one of his most famous buildings today. And I can show you a photo of it. And the waterfall, the creek, runs right through the bottom floor of the house. Oh, that's so cool. So... He he thought buildings and landscapes needed to be intrinsically one as often as as they could be. Well, I sure I, I sure think he would be um one of our premier sustainability advocates. Yes, I think would. he was and I think he would wonder where we're going <laughs> as a society in that sense. So it, this seems purposeful. I'm not sure that I would know the purpose, but again, we have the triangle there, yeah. and now we've got a square over here. You can see that little triangle right there that's literally just part of the decor. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it almost looks like another peak of one of the mountains. Ah, and then you can see really the triangular McDowell's behind. Yes. That's what you were kind of looking at. I think yep. I was mostly showing this mountain, but if you can see the McDowell's behind that and a triangular peak on the top of his home there. Wow, that's amazing. I should say on the top of their home. He yeah. lived here with his wife and children. He did. He okay. Did. And his students. And his students, so right. Whole of course, party here. it was a big party. This is an incredible. Yeah, so this is, uh, to be perfectly honest, uh, this is the part the students usually love the most. They take a lot of pictures right here. They take pictures here, and then they turn around, they take pictures of the valley. And they have an amazing view of the valley. Look at that. So not only does Frank Lloyd Wright know what mountains, you know, what the landscape looks like in his own home, but he's also looking at the view outside. So that's pretty, pretty incredible. So here you can also see um, the, the, uh, his garden room, which for kids would be basically his living room. Um, we can walk over there and you can see some of his uh, interior techniques, which are a little bit easier to see once we go inside. Okay. So while we're walking, Marnie, are there any questions in the chat? Does anybody have a question uh, so far so good? Nobody has put any questions in there yet, but Manny was nice enough to put the link to Falling Water um, in the oh, chat. So we've got that. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I've noticed these amazing oh, sculptures. sculptures. So, There's um, more than one. Less stem, more steam, right? I like but uh, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, was a collector. He uh, was a collector of Japanese woodblock prints and then Asian ceramics, Chinese specifically. Um, I always ask kids, why do you think the woodblock prints aren't on display? They're made of paper. <laughs> uh, <laughs> whereas the ceramics we have outside. So just like kids might collect Pokemon cards or Squishmallows, Frank Lloyd Wright collected things he likes. He was just a man with interests, just like we were people. So he collected this art. Um, he decided to put it outside specifically at places where he wanted you to pause and oh, take a deep breath. Here to pause. And realize you are moving from one space to another. Wow. So it's kind of like an architectural palette cleanser. Hey, Corey, will okay, you, that's cool. will you yeah. uh, get a little closer to that so we can really see what the figures? Okay, there we go. They're from the Qing Dynasty. Um, he purchased them. 
Perfect. We can see them now. Beautiful. Yeah. And so this is an architectural cleansing. Palette. Yeah, he, he wants you to stop and pause. He's kind of saying officially, like, thus ends this space. Now we'll go to this space. Ah. It's kind of, so um, if we think about that like as... we use door frames or welcome mats. Interesting. Using Chinese art from the Qing dynasty. And like we still do. have some, some triangular shapes mm -hmm. as, you know, kind of a little bit of shade and um that's really incredible all right so we'll, we'll go into this is my favorite room this is most kids favorite room this is the room with the most artifacts in it um and this is called the garden room uh or the living room uh i talk to the children a lot about how architecture is a type of art at its best it is it is art that you can live inside and the purpose of all art is to make you feel something mm. right that is no matter what it makes you feel happy makes you feel sad um even a movie right a movie can be art a tv show can be art, art a painting can be art and frank lloyd wright was an architect who believed buildings could be art mm. so as we walk through this doorway he's actually trying to make you feel something there's a technique called compress and release where he lowers the ceiling he swooshes in the walls and then you walk into a secondary space that's much larger. And he does that because that way you feel compressed, you wanna keep moving, and then you feel released when you get to the secondary space. So I don't know how it's gonna work on camera, but Ooh, we can try it. Let's compress and release folks, shall we? Yeah, I'm already feeling a little yeah. small-ish, right? Like this is for me. I'm five six. Um, so there you go, <laughs> camera. Uh-huh. Oh, but there's sun. Okay, yep. but I'm still so I'm still compressed. Mm -hmm. Sorry that that I'm making you wobble a little bit, and then ba -da -ba, release. Now we're up. Now we have a larger space. Yes. So he used that technique a lot in um, a lot of his designs, not just here at Talies West, but in the buildings he bought, built for other people, um, and it was really really common and. You know, it's just one of the many of emotions Frank Lloyd Wright tried to make people feel. He 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 literally is trying to make you feel uncomfortable in the doorway so that you keep moving. So I'm just going to turn around and film. Here is the doorway. There's Mel. She's an amazing uh, person who also is in charge of youth and family. They are they are my co-educator. Co-educators. The education department. Mel's just she's she's on the side over here. But there's amazing. This is just an incredible room. So Mr. Wright is trying to make you feel one thing, then feel another thing when you come inside this space. Um, so geometry isn't just about measurements. It can also be about feelings, which is interesting. Um, also in this room, while we have a little bit of time, um, I always talk to the kiddos about what the roof is made out of and a little bit of material science. So it's hard to see because it's getting a little dark in here, but. The majority of our roofs at Talias and West are made of fabric. You can get oh, this. You can get pretty close okay. to the roof right here. Thank you. It's, I don't know if you guys can see that, Marnie. Can is you see fabric? If that's fabric. <laughs> yeah, I can tell now when you touch it. Wow. Yep, it is fabric. The I majority. No idea. Yeah, the majority of our roof it is waxed to canvas, and this is not because Mr. Wright was not a smart man. He was a very smart man. He knew what he was doing. <laughs> So he wanted Talias and West to feel as close to being outside as possible. Mm. So he knew every choice you make when you are building something, there are positives and negatives. So usually with the kiddos, we, we talk about what could some positive things be of having a fabric roof. It lets in a lot of light. It filters in some light though. So it softens that harsh Arizona light, but it's still bright in here. Um, it kind of, let you uh, feel like you're camping a little bit. It lets air throw, air flow through. Um, but what are some negatives? The students are very good at naming those. Uh... So it is waxed canvas. So the majority of rain doesn't absorb straight through. It doesn't roll off. Um, but yeah, it, say we get a really bad monsoon. Rip, rip right off. Mm. Um, and it's not 100% waterproof. I think bugs. Yeah, bugs. Bugs are something. 
But then, okay, so a little bit of engineering, what can we do about that, right? Frank, has, Mr. Wright has decided he wants these roofs. Um, we have an architect here, he's our head of historic preservation. And he told me in the simplest terms, architecture is about solving problems. Ooh, ooh, did you hear that, Marnie? I think that's what we do in STEM, right? We solve problems. Yeah, so Frank Lloyd Wright, he's got a problem. He wants these fabric roofs, that's what Mr. Wright wants. So. How do you solve that problem? One way they solved it, and we have the kids look at these themes. These are gutters. Ooh, there you go. They are indoor gutters. Little lip right here, and so, the rain goes poop. This is where I need your height, Mar yeah. Marnie, because you could have actually gotten up to get this gutter shot. But, but that is so fascinating. So, so basically the rain comes down on the fabric. Any and any that's not stopped by the wax. So it is got yeah. a little bit of, but yep, it, it beads, beads up right and outside. It, okay. So this sounds to me, it said Manny was there. This sounds to me like one of the Mesa STEM challenges. Yeah. Disaster relief. But there was something else, Manny, that was a STEM challenge where students were had to build gutters. Maybe that's the one, but that's pretty, pretty fascinating. And one of the coolest things is that we have, so not my department, but we have an entire different department that deals with higher education. And they work with architecture schools all around the country who come here and help us solve different questions like this. So nowadays we we are a historic site, we're a museum. So we we want different things than Mr. Wright wanted. <laughs> we want air conditioning. What? We want we want the roof to never leak, not just sometimes never leak, right? Wow. So, but we want to preserve his vision, which was that beautiful translucency, ah, yes. um, that beautiful fabric roof. So there are architecture schools that are helping us do studies to see what fabric, modern fabric, we can use that keeps those artistic principles, but technologically does what we needed to do. I love it. And, and so, I bet there's technological oh, in, yeah. innovation yes. in what these fabrics are and or how you can come up with some of the solutions to these problems, yeah, the these modern problems. The University of Pennsylvania specifically, I believe, did a did a study that like, measure humidity and different fabrics. And, yeah, mm -hmm. it's really cool. And then I also see that the the light. So it's it's short. This room feels it's a triangle. Uh, <laughs> There you go. See, it was all, it's all geometry. I'll figure it out eventually, students. That's why I'm here too. So there's a lot of triangular shapes just keeping you abreast of this concept of being kind of inside of a mountain. Yeah. And then um a little bit more STEM. So during our our winter break camp that we'll be doing shortly, um, we talk about staying cold in a cold climate, kind of funny in Arizona, but as you know, it gets chilly here. Um, and frankly, great. And the students were only here in the winter. They were here Halloween to Easter. There were snowbirds. Those luckies. And so when I talk to students during winter break camp, we talk about our value, which is the ability of a material to hold temperature. So our value is how contractors, um, decide which insulation they want, higher R value, more insulation. So things like rocks have a different R value than glass, have a different R value than cardboard. So even the choice of using rocks around the fireplace was something that was chosen for the R value, was chosen for the artistic beauty, form, and function. So we tie it all together when we do winter break camp. Amazing. Are there any questions in the chat, Marnie, or any questions that are bubbling up over um, from folks who are watching uh, virtually? No questions, but everyone's just amazed and really enjoying uh, the tour so far. We're all learning quite a bit. So yeah, everyone's Thank really you. enjoying yeah. it. And and Manny put in there, it's the sustainable skyscrapers that that relates to. So yeah, that's really that's, neat. High end yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Manny. See, tell the students that Frank Lloyd Wright's been doing it since 1939. So they're still, uh, so they're, they're doing a great job going to Mesa STEM competitions. So we can go um, into the room and we can talk specifically about the different options we have during field trips. Okay. And you guys didn't get too much of a view other than um, what you saw outside of the garden. Sorry, I just whipped around, but there's also an outside space there. Um, but again, in the show notes, we will make sure a virtual tour. we'll make sure that you've got the virtual tour link 
and also, um, gosh, I would just come up here with your students. It is fantastic. It truly is. And Abby is a breadth of knowledge. So appreciate all of your, your assistance and time. So I'm walking into the. So this is one of our conference rooms. This is generally not a space that students go into. Um, but it's actually named after Frank Lloyd Wright's number one uh, right-hand man, Wes Peters. Um, he designed, uh, he helped oversee the building. There we go. Uh, <laughs> ASU Gamage. Oh, Gamage. Gamage. Everybody knows that here in Arizona, yes. that yes. Gamage was a Frank Lloyd Wright architectural. It was, um, but Wes was the one, Wes Peters was the one who helped oversee that. And this is called the West Peters Conference. Okay, so West Peters needs a little bit more love is what I'm thinking here. All right, so we've got a beautiful room here. Uh, it looks like a, a uh, Frank Lloyd right there who's watching over us in this amazing meeting room. Look at that. Jeez, that's gorgeous. So Mel was willing to hold the camera in case you want to sit and ask some questions and we can talk. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Mel. All right, I will allow you to do that there you go thank you so mel's holding the camera and uh i'll ask a few questions about what we have here and ultimately folks i think what you want to know as a stem teacher is how do i i mean if i can't bring my students up sure. here I, I mean i want to but you know perhaps what can i bring to my classroom that you might do here at franklin rights yeah so first of all, uh, our field trip program, a little bit about that. It is currently, it is $10 a student. Um, Title I schools are free of charge. Title I schools are free of charge. <laughs> Make sure everybody hears that. Title yeah, one hang, hey, hang on one second. Mel, I'm gonna ask you to just step a tiny bit closer oh. and hold the camera a little still. There we go. All right, I think we might be able to hear you a little bit better, but I did hear all Title right. I schools are- Yeah, free of charge. So our go. field trip program, Non-Title I schools is $10 per student. Title I schools are free of charge. However, please still book. Don't just show up. <laughs> Don't show up. You have to book a spot. Yes. <laughs> um, and all that information is on our website. Um, just feel free to come on in mm -hmm. now yeah. and get some of this information, some of this great yeah. stuff. Yeah, so when you come for a field trip, every field trip starts with a one hour guided tour. And we just showed you a little flavor of that just now. But then following that is a 45 minute learning lab of, of the teacher, the bookers choosing. We have three learning labs currently. We have one that's called Architecture Math Mayhem. Ooh, Architecture Math Mayhem, I love it. <laughs> um, we have one called the Art and Science of Cyanotypes. And then we have one called building bridges. So let's start with the math. So the math field trip is the one where, sorry, no. the kiddos. I'm just in your way. We go to our, go it's, it's our outdoor classroom space. Our outdoor classroom is basically if Frank Lloyd Wright designed a gazebo. Um, it's about the size of a gazebo. And we give the students measuring tapes. And we talk to them about area. We talk to them about perimeter. Some students haven't gotten to that yet in school. Maybe they're first graders. They, they have never even heard of it. Um, if they're more advanced students, we also add a section on scale and how scale on paper converts to scale in real life. I love that. Um, Everybody needs to know that. Yeah. So depending on the age group of your students, we can flex that super easy. But then we break the students into two groups and we have them measure this outdoor classroom space. And we give them one of these sheets with all the walls labeled, but no measurements. Mel and I know the actual measurements of the building. And we have a contest to see who can get closest measure for precision to the actual measurements of the building. Um, sometimes they're pretty close. Sometimes. sometimes they're not. <laughs> I'm like, where were you? What were you measuring? Um, then we also, depending on how time allows, because 45 minutes can fly, um, we have about 20 Frank Lloyd Wright 
uh, oriented themed word problems that Mel and I have really enjoyed writing. I love it. Uh, word problems. This is perfect yep. because that's what they're going to need to know. Yep. So, and the answer is always area, perimeter, or scale. And then they get bonus points if they actually do the math and solve the problem for area, perimeter, or scale. Okay. So don't tell teachers, don't tell them the answers. Oh, yeah. We'll edit this part out, right? Or you, oh, man. You stop. Oh, man. They get, they get so competitive too. They're because we always, we always make it a, a contest as i'm sure any teacher knows they they take that seriously so that's the math mayhem that is architecture math mayhem okay so then we have um the art and science of blueprints and that's all this beautiful work right here um what a lot of students what a lot of adults i found don't realize we always start with the question why are blueprints called blueprints oh, yeah good good question I, I always thought it was like the ink that it was. That You're close, but why is the ink blue? Yeah, because it's uh, um, formaldehyde. I'm like, <laughs> go ahead. Exactly, exactly. So architecture is about solving problems. So is almost anything to do with design. So about, I don't know, let's say it's 300 years ago and you are an architect. Maybe you're George Washington's architect, right? You're building George Washington's mansion. George Washington's mansion has a lot of rooms in it. There's a lot of people helping to build it, right? So then a lot of people need copies of the plans. How do you make copies of plans 300 years ago? What do you do? The answer is you draw it over and over and over and over and over again. And you draw it exactly the same time, the same way every time, right? And that gets annoying. It's like a lot of work. It's a lot of work. So architects had this problem. They needed a cheap, easy way to copy their plans so that when they gave them to other people, to the builders, to the bricklayers, the, the electricians, that they all had copies of the same plans. So we talk a little bit of social studies, who was the man who invented this process. It was actually someone that was trying to invent photography. Huh. So he came up with a type of photography Photography, little English language arts, literally means to capture with light. That's what we're doing right here. We're capturing with light. <laughs> it is. And so technically this, it's a photograph, right? You captured a, an image with light. But somebody figured out if you lay a drawing of a building using really thick graphite, you can make a copy. Now you have to use these special chemicals. Mm. We talked to the kids about the chemicals. Chemical that cyano. So um, I'm interested in like the sustainability portion of this or, but so cyan, cyan just means blue. Right. So the beautiful thing about this and why architects liked it so much is that this uses um, iron. Thank you. This uses iron. The other types of photography that were invented around a similar time period use silver, right? So other people were making other ways to copy stuff like daguerreotypes that other people might have heard of. Um, but that's expensive. And architects, they're like, no, no, we don't want to make art. We don't want to make photography with this. We we just want copy. We want blueprints. Yeah. So this is cheaper, way cheaper. So, but the only problem is the only color you can get. You can only get one color. You get blue. So everywhere that is blocked by the sun in your drawing the black stays white and everywhere that has a chemical reaction with the sun turns blue and now we've got chemistry folks so there's all kinds of stem happening in architecture and who knew and here i thought to myself i just remember those triplicate copies right and that's what i'm thinking oh yeah yeah the, the yeah Carbon copies. Yeah, the carbon yeah. copies that didn't have the great, um, I don't know, chemical. So yeah, so the kiddos, we talked to them a little bit. We give them that social studies background, but we talked to them a little bit about the chemical compounds and why, you know, this is preferable to a silver-based one. We talked to them about a positive and a negative image, because these are all about creative, a positive and a negative image. The kids then get to draw their own blueprint, make a cyanotype, and take one of these home. That is so cool. I mean, talk about hands-on STEM and talking 
about different parts of science that come into the mathematical piece of drawing. So architecture is definitely a STEAM yes. centered style topic. And then so now we're going to talk about bridge design. Yeah, so blueprints. We went from uh, mayhem and math yeah. to blueprints to the bridge design. Tell us about yeah. that activity. So we we do a whole unit on bridges. This is the third of our three uh, 45 minute labs you can choose from. We talk to the kids about what bridges were used for. We talk about one of Frank Lloyd Wright's bridges. He's not known as a bridge designer, but the man did do a few bridges. Um, we look at, we got some photos from the archives of his bridge specifically. Oh, I did not know he was a bridge, he was a bridge designer either. That he dabbled, he dabbled in it. Are there um, any bridges here on property? Like, um, a lot of basic, basic ones, little, yeah, like over ditches, those okay. kind of, those kind of bridges. Okay. Um, can you, for the can one of you repeat the, uh, the official name of the third workshop? No, the name. Oh. Building bridges. It's just building bridges. bridges. Got it. Okay. Very creative. Not my best. <laughs> All right. Keep going. Um, for any uh, grown-ups at home, I do not tell this to children, but this bridge, this model, was in Die Hard. Oh. <laughs> it was used as a prop. Well, that's because they wouldn't know what Die Hard is. How, li how old is that? <laughs> but I don't. I, yeah. But I think that's really cool. I love it. Um. So we talked to the kids about bridges, about Frank Lloyd Wright's bridge. We talk about the difference between an architect and an engineer. I'm not sure if you can see this, but it's not, yeah. it works. Um, we talk to kids about the difference between an architect and an engineer, their different roles they play. Um, and then we talk to the kids about span and load. The most important thing about load is that there's live load and dead load. So dead load is the weight of the bridge itself. So the bridge has to at least be able to hold itself up. <laughs> so there's, Right. Ideally, it can hold a lot more than itself. But right. Yes, we start there. Right. So then there's a little bit of what, what materials do you use? If you build a bridge of rocks, it's sturdier, but then it has to hold more dead load. Right. So we, a little bit of that. Um, and then the live load is what you add to the bridge that you want it to carry. So will this be a bridge just for bunny rabbits? Is this a bridge for cars? <laughs> like, what, what are you trying to do with this bridge? I love it. Um, we talk about the different types of bridges. So there's a beam bridge, an arch bridge, and a truss bridge. Um, we talk about form and function, which we also talk about on the tour. Love it. And then um, we end with the engineering design cycle ah. because the oh. challenge is to design a bridge. We can hold on to that just a, oh. little, a little bit longer. Sure. Because we we lovingly call ours the engineering design process. Oh, okay. But as you see, the EDP is in everything, including architecture. Yes, That's so absolutely wonderful. So then we give the kids the we tell them nothing. <laughs> we give them no explanation. And this is a good tip, STEM teachers. You don't always have to give them explanation. Oh yeah, we so these are connects, and the most important thing about these connects, if you want to buy some for your own classroom, these are vintage connects. These are from the early 2000s. You can get them on eBay. Don't buy modern connects. They're smaller and they're fiddlier and I hate them. <laughs> <laughs> the old connects, so these ones are from, like if you just type in like vintage connects into eBay, you can get these ones. You know that I'm going to come and check out the vintage connects. Okay. okay. And you don't tell them anything. I tell them nothing. And then? And we say, we give them a span. We usually pull two uh, six foot tables together and we give them a span, usually about three feet. Um, but we tell them this is your span and your job is to build a bridge with the time remaining to see whose bridge can hold the most weight. We break them into teams. That's cool. <laughs> no sample. I like it. I like it. So which bridge can hold the most weight is the challenge. Yes. And we, we talked to them also a little bit about the strongest shape in architecture, which is the triangle. We have, we usually draw a triangle and explain how forces are evenly distributed throughout a triangle, making it the strongest shape and how as you're building your bridge, the more triangle you can add to it, the stronger it's going to be, which is the heart of a truss bridge. Ah, so again, it sounds like math, engineering, science achievement, building bridges, mm -hmm. something our students do in some STEM competitions. Oh, so yeah. maybe we could have a guest speaker come for one of our STEM competitions. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. From Frank Lloyd Wright's Taliesin. So yeah, so they build the bridges. We put, it's very scientific. We put a bowl with washers on it. 
and put washers on it until the bridges fall apart. And we count them, and whoever gets the most washers wins, and the prize is always the honor and glory of winning. The honor and glory of winning. So don't think that you have to come up with something uh, crazy special. To, sometimes it just happens to do. They get and just I, having a good time. I have seen 16-year-olds who spent my, the entire tour like this. Okay. We get to the bridge part. They get so into it. They're like, everyone's counting one, two. They get to the end. They all cheer. They're jumping up and down. They get into it. Into so, it. I think something about building something yourself um, and trying it, it being a contest always helps. So they, they really enjoy it. And we do that with everyone, like I said, kindergarten to 12th graders. I've done this with grownups and they love it. I, I'm, I, I'm only not diving into this because I know I'm still on camera and I, I'll, I don't want to distract everyone. <laughs> But I will say um, three amazing activities are each 45 minutes. So your students, so students can come do the tour and then have an activity. Is yeah, that what you're that's saying? usually what we do. Uh, so yeah, they do one hour tour, 45 minutes for the learning lab. And then if they need to stay for a lunch, we allow lunch space if they'd like to as well. So the whole field trip experience usually can take between two hours, two and a half hours. Okay. And that's flexible. So, Marty, I, I don't, I'm i so excited about all of this. The concept of the tour, I know we're running low on time. There's a beautiful sunset outside, too, that Mel can swing around and get oh. so that everybody knows just how gorgeous it is when when you're here. So um, what kind of questions does our does anybody have? Does anybody have a question before we uh, are finished? I know we're at 52 after the hour. Yep. Um, so first question, what are the age ranges for students? Yeah so, um, yeah, so we uh, we offer a field trip for any student K through 12. Okay. When you call me or Mel, when you email us um, to book, we would recommend based on the strengths of your students, different learning labs based on their abilities. So I would not recommend, for example, that a kindergartner does the cyanotype one. They really struggle with understanding um, history, uh, the passage of time, chronology. Um, so it just turns into a craft for them, which is fine. But I think they take away more from maybe the bridge building activity. So we would never tell any group that has their heart set on a specific learning lab, no, but we would guide them towards the one that's most appropriate for their age group. And that is also written in the learning lab descriptions on our website. Okay, great. And for everyone, we will be posting the link to their website in the show notes um, that so you can get those descriptions. Another question is, is there a, what are the size limits for the groups if, if teachers want to bring groups of students? That is unfortunately our biggest downfall. Frank Lloyd Wright does not design the space for 300 kids at once, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so at I don't know if a teacher who wants to bring 300 kids at once, so that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to the science center on a busy day and sometimes I'm just like, whoa. Um, the most that we can take at this time is 60 kiddos total. They'd mm -hmm. be split into two subgroups. An entire school with more than that, we'd book across multiple days. Okay. And oh, about how far out are you booked? Are there certain times of year that you get much, like we got to book six months in advance or something? Sure. So I would say, um, like, if you wanted a field trip in December, I could probably still find a date or two for you. Um, we we kind of had a hard reset after COVID. Who didn't? Um, so we are rebuilding our, our field trip program, and it is not at fully booked out capacity yet. With that in mind, if you want, like, your number one choice of date for March, I would give me a call in January. So at the beginning of, of the semester. So for August, if you want to come in October, just call at the beginning of the semester and then you'll get your most choice of dates. Oh, a, a, a good eight weeks would be a great buffer for, yeah. for you. Okay, great. Um, no, there's not other questions in the chat at the moment. Uh, I have another question. Do you have other more advanced type workshops? I, I heard you talk about camp a little bit. Are there some yeah. other advanced ones for more advanced students? Sure. So, yeah. So Mel and I are responsible for anything for anyone under the age of 18 here at Taliesin West and the people who love them. So we <laughs> we do uh, 
homeschool programs, those are for ages six to 11. Um, we do Girl Scout programs. Those go all the way up to Girl Scouts who could be in 10th grade. Um, and we also do summer camps. So we do, or we do a winter break camp, a spring break camp, and eight weeks of summer camp. Those camps vary for age group each week. So the youngest campers we have are six. The oldest campers we have are 16. And those have all sorts of different themes each week as well. So last summer, I can tell you, we had a camp for 14 to 16 year olds. That was about urban planning. Um, we had a professor from the ASC School of Urban Design come in as a special guest speaker. We talked about real issues that communities are facing like um, sustainability, walkability, um, police enforcement. How many, how many police departments do you want in your city for it to be safe? We had some really good discussion with kids in those age groups. And then they drew, they drew their own cities. They built models of parts of their city. And those, yeah, those are pretty advanced kiddos. Great. Oh, thank you. And earlier on at the beginning, you had mentioned the virtual reality, you know, if people can't actually come visit. Do you have any other kind of materials or things that teachers could do, you know, in their classroom if they can't come. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a section of our website and I can I can send it to both of you to put in the notes um, called the, the Right Virtual Classroom. It's a lot of our lesson plans that we threw online during the pandemic so that when we were unable to connect to teachers in, in real life, they could use our lesson plans just in the way you're talking about. But even now, we still welcome anyone to go to our website and download those lesson plans and use them as often as, as they'd like. Also, you are always welcome to email us. Um, our email address is education at franklloydwright.org. We are always happy to, to help, you know, brainstorm ideas or answer questions, anything like that. Wonderful. Well, and viewers, I want to remind you that don't worry, we will get the email address, we will get their website address, we will have links to their resources all available in the show notes. Um, that goes goes along with the transcript of this video. Uh, oh, I have one more question. How many groups of 60 students would you see in a day? Okay, so how many groups could you could you do of 60? <laughs> one. <laughs> Just so one. Uh, we are we are a, a department currently of two, um, strong and mighty, and, and the mighty one just picked up my camera, so she 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 jumps in just like we do. Yeah. So I'm excited. Yeah. About yeah. So as as time goes by, you know, if you ask me that question five, five years from now, we might have a very different answer. But for the the remainder of this school year and for the 2024 2025 school year, I would say one group of sixty at a time. Wonderful. Well, I, everyone in the chat who's made comments has been, has absolutely loved this. And so have I, I, I'm embarrassed to say I've lived here most of my entire life and have never been there and didn't know most of this information. So I am just thrilled that we got to visit with you today. So Corey, do you yeah, got Thank you so much for inviting us to talk. We're, we're always thrilled to connect with educators, to community members. Um, we just want people to know we're, we're up here on the mountain in Scottsdale. <laughs> and, and I want to say, uh, send a special shout out to Pam Folk over at Paradise Valley uh, High School's Crest Program, who actually put this together with Abby. She was unable to make it tonight, but a huge shout out. So if anybody listens um, who's from Paradise Valley, uh, Pam has some background in architecture and her dream was to bring a STEM leadership showcase of architecture. And so really this was her brainchild. So a shout out to Pam Folk Marnie, thank you for jumping in. Abby is so excited. Uh, this is, I've learned so much myself. So I'm so lucky hard to be able to be here. And wow. if you don't mind handing me the camera back, I've got to show you Mel here who oh. just jumped right in and said, I'm ready and I will do it. And these two amazing ladies with a beautiful sunset in the backdrop here um, are, are waiting for you to come and book your Book your trip, book your field trip um, to Frank Lloyd Wright's Taliesin West, which is Welsh for eyebrow. Shining eyebrow. Shining eyebrow, yes. Mine aren't quite as shiny, but um, yeah, look at Marnie. She's got some good shining eyebrows. I got eyebrows. some good eyebrows. <laughs> so if you learn nothing else, I'm sure there's a few takeaways. So feel free to ask anybody what their takeaways are. I know I took a whole lot away. So Great. thank you. Thank, thank you. Both of you. Thank you so much. Yep. Yeah.
just so much steam wrapped up in architecture. I mean, I think I was kind of lopsided and thinking, oh, it's just building buildings, but the art, <laughs> the color, the fashion, the science, uh, the math. So thank you very much. I look thank forward you. to visiting. All right. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Marnie. Thanks, everybody who joined us. And we'll see you next time at our STEM Leadership Cadre Showcase. The next one is at the Science Vortex in Cottonwood, Arizona. Sometime in January, we'll keep you abreast. Make sure you're following canyonpd.com to learn more about these kinds of amazing opportunities in STEM and STEAM all around the Valley and beyond. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye.